Well, good evening. Um, my name is Anna Heller. I serve as the Bruce A. Beal Director of the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here tonight uh, for a very special conversation. Uh, before I um, introduce our special guest tonight, I would like to um, offer a special welcome and thanks to the leadership of Rollins College, both members of the Board of Trustees and our President and, and Mrs. Cornwell, as well as members of the President's Cabinet, and together with the members of our Museum Board of Visitors, I want to thank all of you in particular for imagining and helping us accomplish the future of our college and the future of our museum. So thank you for being here. It is my privilege tonight to introduce three very special people. Um, but before I do so, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the project which is the, the main topic of the conversation tonight, and that started in 2016 when um, the artists Eric Gottesman and Hank Willis Thomas founded Four Freedoms, an artist-led and artist-run super PAC that uh, was intended as a, an anti-partisan platform, a creative platform uh, that dealt with civic engagement discourse and direct action. And the name comes from the four freedoms first articulated by President Roosevelt in 1941 in his State of the Union address that were then um, immortalized artistically by the four paintings by Norman Rockwell. And um, that's, um, the, the, of course, the freedoms from fear, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, and freedom from want. And uh, they, they formed the um, uh, not only a basis for the title, but also the, in a way, the DNA of the uh, entire Four Freedoms uh, movement um, and artistic platform. In 2018, um, a, an initiative called 50 States was launched by Four Freedoms, and we were very lucky to be one of the 300 plus institutional partners. Um, we held events here uh, related to Four Freedoms, and it was an extraordinary opportunity for us to engage our campus, um, our students, and our community in um, a, a lawn sign activation and in discussion about uh, the role of civic discourse uh, in relationship to art. Now, the two artists who are here tonight and who are the founders of For Freedom, um, For Freedoms, they have very distinct um, and, and very robust, I, I wanna call them consequential, individual practices and, and careers, and I will just spend a couple of minutes introducing them in turn. Um, Hank Willis Thomas is a photo conceptual artist who, whose, uh, uh, main exploration has to do with the framing and con context of images and how we interpret them um, and, and proposing alternative meaning or inverting their meanings and their significance through changing that context. Uh, he very often uh, deals with themes related to the representation of race and um, also related politics of visual culture. Um, Hank Willis Thomas has degrees from um, NYU and from the um, from Cal Arts and an, uh, a number of honor honorary doctorates um, from Maryland and the Institute uh, for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts. Other honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, an AGO Photography Prize in 2017, and a Soros Equality Fellowship, among others. And the first comprehensive survey of Hank Willis Thomas's work is uh, open this fall at the uh, Portland Art Museum. Um, I should say um, that we are very proud to have works by both Hank Willis Thomas and Eric Gottesman in our collection. Um, Eric Gottesman is a photographer, a writer, a teacher, and an activist with a practice centered on collaboration. Um, and and it's, it's those themes that resonate so well in both their works that have made their work such favorites with our campus community and with our, with our students in particular. He holds degrees from Duke and Bard College and teaches currently at SUNY at Purchase also is a mentor in the Arab Documentary Photography Project in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, a number of awards and honors as well, including an International Center of Photography Infinity Award in 2017, Creative Capital Artist Grant in 15, and Fulbright Fellowships, among many others. Uh, his work has been exhibited at the Addison Gallery of American Art, the Cordoba Museum and Sculpture Park, um, and um, notably here at the Cornell. Um, <laughs> 
in our fractured narratives um, a strategy to engage um, in 2015. Uh, the conversation between um, Eric and Hank will be moderated by Abigail Ross Goodman and um, Abigail is the founder and principal of Goodman Taft, uh, an advisory and curatorial firm that uh, specializes in post-war um, and contemporary art, has more than 20 years experience as a gallerist, um, art advisor and curator, and most importantly, Abigail is a consulting curator here at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum and the curatorial brains behind uh, the Alphonse collection. And if I may, I'd like to just stop a moment here and acknowledge Barbara and Ted Alphonse, without who are here tonight with us, without whom there would be no Alphonse collection, no Eric and Hank in the collection, no Abby, and we wouldn't all be here tonight celebrating. So thank you, Barbara and Ted. Um, the, in, in Art for Rawlings Volume 3, which some of you I hope had the chance to read, um, which Abigail co-edited with her colleague Molly um, Epstein, um, Abby wrote that Hank and Eric are agents and architects of global change through their work. And I want to hand over to podium, the podium to Abigail to, to moderate the discussion between Hank and Eric, but before I do that I want to say that for us, Abby has been herself an agent of change because the, the, she coined that the, not only did she uh, really um, help uh, create and develop the, the Alphonse collection, but in the early days she coined the term visual syllabus for the Alphonse collection and that to us, at least for me, was one of those aha moments that, that gave us, the Cornell staff, the chance to look not only at the Alphonse collection but at our collection as a whole as the platform and the, the, the basis for our teaching. And it, it really, just as the Alphonse Collection has changed the collection of our museum, engaging with it has given us a renewed energy and a different perspective to teach with our entire collection. So thank you for that, Abigail. And please help me welcome Abigail Ross Goodman, Eric Gottesman, and Hank Willis Thomas. Thank you. making the time to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and for your engagement with our community, which is over a decade long, really, for both of you. Um, and thank you to Dr. Heller and Dr. Carbonell for letting us take the stage tonight. Um, just as a quick plug, they just opened an exhibition at the International Center for Photography uh, in New York City. So if anyone's traveling north, it's a way to kind of deepen your engagement with the conversation tonight. So I hope you'll check it out. I don't want to delay jumping into our dialogue. There is so much to discuss. We could really actually be here all night. But just so you have a framework, we're looking at about 45 minutes of conversation and then a period of Q&A at the end. Um, so as a brief history, um, both Eric and Hank have had this substantial relationship with Rollins, as I said, over a decade, both their, through their inclusion of works in the collection of the Alfond Collection of Contemporary Art, but also um, through their inclusion in exhibitions, like the current exhibition on view at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, and prior exhibitions like Fractured Narratives, A Strategy to Engage. So when their practice evolved to this next level of collaboration <laughs> uh, around Four Freedoms, this platform for civic engagement, discourse, direct action, as it emerged, it was really a natural fit for deepening our engagement and research into their work and into their practice. 
In fact, some of you in the audience may recall, either students or faculty, the lawn sign activations and the town hall conversation that was hosted just here this fall. Um, but that said, for those who are new, let's start at the beginning. So you set, to set the stage, you met in San Francisco just after 9-11, two young uh, conceptual photographers working in the medium of photography, um, where you were already understanding that your practices were expansive, that a photograph was, or an image was just one part of what you did. So one of the things we're curious about is, can you each remember the first work or the first moment when you created something and you realized that it was, your world was gonna go beyond the thing you created, and that it was gonna be much more around your role as an activist, as a political animal, as someone who is an agent of change? <laughs> yeah, I'll start. Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, thank you, first of all, for having us here. Thank you, Abby, for bringing us into the collection and into uh, the lives of everybody here at Rollins and, and to the Alphonse for, and, and my mom, who Barbara's pointing at, who I, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna save another whole question for my mom, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, um, I didn't study art in college, and so for me, um, the idea of art being objects that just existed in a museum or a gallery or in, in space was never really had like currency, but, um, uh, but so when I started becoming an artist unwittingly uh, and I started making images, I, I, like the first image that comes to mind when you, when you ask that question is, was an image I made in Ethiopia where I was making, I was just there um, for, I, was, I had been there for a few months. Um, I eventually spent 20 years working there, uh, but I, ha I was just kind of getting into understanding what my role was as an artist and what my, what I was learning about Ethiopia about which I knew very little. And so there was a photograph that I made of a woman who uh, was HIV positive at the time and didn't allow me to show her face. And um, in it, there are hands of a friend of hers that cover her identity. Um, and, and that image, which we showed at the salon that Hank and I met at, at my apartment in, uh, in San Francisco that Jessica Ingram, the, another artist and photographer who's here with us tonight, was also there at. And there were several other young artists meeting every month to look at new work and, you know, eat chicken fingers that I made, like, and like, whatever, we were just creating an artist community. I think I showed that image there, and it was, it was less about the image that I made and more about the relationship with that person and the limitations that that person was placing on our relationship as a microcosm of politics and social relations that led me down a path of thinking about, you know, collaboration and relationships as a medium of art making. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we reflected a bit today on the fact that for you, relationships are one of the core elements of what you bring into your practice and one of the things that's really helped to shape Four Freedoms in its current status. Hank, what about you? What was the moment? Well, my moment was actually a moment of failure. Um, in, well, on February 2nd, 2000, my cousin was murdered in Philadelphia, and he was uh, in all ways kind of my life plan. I was just gonna be his, uh, his backup dancer, was my whole goal. Um, and um, it was shocking because, you know, he wasn't the type of person you'd think would fall victim to gun violence, et cetera. And then uh, I remember photographing, as I felt as a photographer, the responsibility of documenting his funeral. I don't know, Jessica and I um, have always photographed our family, and that was the moment when I felt like no picture could tell the story, the complexity of emotions that me and my family were feeling. And so that's the moment I stopped being a photographer in earnest um, and felt the need to make work that quote unquote meant something. Not that I knew what that meant, but I, I felt that just the medium of recording wasn't enough um, because there were so many other 
things that I wanted to get across that I couldn't get across in a single photograph. Absolutely. And did you see that in each other initially? Did you see the sense of that you were both coming at your practices from this vantage point, or did it kind of slip into the conversation? I mean, I didn't know Eric was a real photographer when I met him. <laughs> <laughs> the jury's still out. Yeah. But um, there was the three of us uh, were in a book called 25 Photographers Under 25, and um, that was a while ago. Um, and uh, we really um, didn't understand why someone else had chosen us to be artists to represent um, a generation of photographers. It felt connected by our lost sense of like, oh, well, someone said we're important, but we don't really know what we're doing. And I think that bonded us with a group of other photographers who, um, many of whom we've gotten to work with, with Four Freedoms. And um, Eric and I really have mostly been trying to figure each other out for the most of the past <laughs> 20 years, being like, I kind of get what you're saying, but I kind of, Disagree, or let me add to that. And so our, our collaboration has been a result of our curiosity about our different approaches. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think what struck me first, and this was, I don't know if this was like Hank or our group at that time, or just my introduction to artistic thinking and being around other young artists, but it was, it was the openness to be critical of ourselves and change and sort of, um, that was okay, because like, I did that on my own all the time, but I didn't do it necessarily in groups. Like, so that, that was really exciting. Well, one of the things that's been revealed over the time of our talking together over years is that all of your collaboration in Four Freedoms really is an ongoing dialogue. It's a conversation that you're having with each other day in and day out, and that the program is getting refined as you go. Um, and one of the things, hopefully this is gonna work, Thanks. Um, one of the places where you started to have a conversation was around these images by Norman Rockwell, made in 1943, as Anna said, you know, um, in a response to Roosevelt's articulation of the freedoms, freedom from fear, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, and freedom from want. And the relationship between these, which in a way becomes the name of the organization with a twist, um, can you talk a little bit about how those two things dovetailed, your exploration of these images, which came first, um, and the title of? Well, I think you should talk about how you came up with sort of a, a conception of, of working with those images. Sure. Um, well, I mean, in a lot of ways, I've always really been drawn to um, popular culture as a, I'm, I'm a, a very avid, I think, uh, consumer of, of, of popular culture, advertising, and getting to know Rockwell's paintings as like the, I, the kind of iconic Americana images. Um, I've always loved them, especially as images from the civil rights era. Uh, but um, I looked at these images and I noticed that there were a lot of um, Americans that were missing in this representation. Um, and I, there, you can see there's uh, freedom of worship. It seemed like you could be Catholic or you could be Protestant. Uh, and there's like one African-American person, the woman there in the top left corner with words over her face. That you can see the Catholic priest is in, in the shadows. So uh, in this time of like kind of American progress or trying to talk about the values um, it, so many people were not included, and uh, I, I thought it would be um, necessary or good to try to update those images, but recognizing that there would be uh, myopia that someone 75 years later would look at the images that we create and see, well, a, a lot of things that we're missing. Um, but Eric, do you want to like take it from there? I mean, then, you know, yeah, it is working now. Um, well, before we even get to remaking the images, we started batting around these ideas about art and politics that we had been talking about for 20 years since our days in San Francisco. And, um, you know, at some point we were together at a conference in Italy in Florence. And 
in 2015, and uh, before we knew who was, you know, going to be the candidate or the president, um, and we were talking about finally doing something at this intersection of art and politics, and so uh, we decided to do something. We didn't know what it was going to be. First thing we did was we had to get a, a name and a, a website, and we like. I think I, I wish I could. We could remember the other possible names for the organization that we had, but all those URLs were taken online, <laughs> and so <laughs> so we finally stumbled through. We we tried FOURfreedoms.org or whatever, and that was taken too. And so, wow, what about FOR Freedoms? And we we oh that was free. Okay, let's th get that. So that <laughs> that was like the grand scheme behind the name. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like you were like uh, F O R freedoms is taken. I was like, and I'm like, we're for freedoms. Like, yeah, we're for freedom. That's kind of funny. <laughs> and you also said, <laughs> and you also said that for freedom is something that basically 99% of the world, no matter what their perspective, would be able to yeah lock into, right? Yeah, it's something that is you know is is used as a material and as a as a language to define um, <laughs> interesting audio installation. But, um, <laughs> It's, it's used as a language to, freedom is used to, to define a number of things and you can see how it's used today or throughout history. The, the concept of what freedom is or what freedom isn't. We were, we were gonna dispense with all that and say, yeah, we're for all the freedoms, even the freedoms we don't agree with necessarily. Um, but of course, we didn't know what that meant at the time and so we just kind of ran with it. Uh, and but also making art is also often about an adventure where you don't know where you're going when you begin. And, and the idea of, of FDR's Four Freedoms and these uh, Rockwell's representation of them was like what we were gonna do first, but then I think we felt that we weren't ready to make the images, and so we decided, well, in part because the original conception of them was quite a bit different than what ended up. I mean, the, the original conception of them, you know, the sketches, were sort of more incendiary in a way. And once we, once we started getting into the making of them, it was a, it, 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 there were a lot of people that were invited into the process that we didn't necessarily expect were going to be part of the images. And then the images shifted. And then there were multiple images. There was no longer, we weren't just replacing these four original American icons with new icons. We were replacing it with the notion of you know, multitudes, which we talked about in the essay in the catalog. You know, um, that there were many different visions and there wasn't just one vision of what it meant to be American. And it, just to step back for a second, so the fact that these ideas were in a way the kernel of Four Freedoms, the organization, but they kind of sat in the wings for a while while the organization took shape, while you started to understand what it might mean for your work to live in the world. And then you came back to them. And can you talk to us a little bit about the concepts of who you invited to include, how you leverage celebrity. Hank, you talked a little bit about how you've always been really interested in kind of the public consumption of images and how your expertise in that way influences these images. And as we said before, you know, Eric's kind of relationship building that has always been central and core to his work, how that influenced the coming together and give us a little bit of the architecture and I can point to individuals that you wanna identify or go to the next slide. Art making is always, I think, an act of faith. There's a, a, a way in which we, we deal with artists face their failures on a regular basis, um, because sometimes what starts off as a great idea winds up being a terrible idea, and you don't know it until you've actually spent months or years working on it. Um, and then um, there's, a, and so even getting something started takes a lot of courage. Um, and in a way, our courage was because when we first had the idea of Four Freedoms, we met some, some friends who were collectors and they were like, okay, well, we had this, if you guys make these images, we'll fund it. Mm. And then two years later, they were like, are you ever gonna make the images? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, on a random, uh, because we were invited to an exhibition, curate exhibition in LA uh, about art and politics, uh, we said, okay, well, we're gonna try to shoot these images and we, asked a friend who's uh, an LA like Hollywood photographer to collaborate with us in the high plot, who was also in the book. Emily Shore. Emily Shore. Uh, uh, to, to, um, to help like make really kind of luscious images of these. And then 
we got, this is a weird story. I don't even know why I'm telling it. But, we, but it's fascinating because so we so we get to LA and we, we have these sketches and we have a, a crew and um, the people who were going to give us the space uh, got shut down by the fire department. Uh, and so uh, and then some some ladies who we kind of knew were just like um, we're just going to knock on doors for you in downtown LA where there's not a lot of people who live until we can get a space and then like the. Tenth door they knocked on. This guy was like, "Sure, you can come shoot here." And so we <laughs> went into his space, and then um, people like who were coming to the exhibition started to come. They would bring them over. So Rosario Dawson, who was doing a tour of the exhibition, came over. Who's in the top left? Uh, a, an art, a, a actor who's pretty prominent, Michael Ely, um, who I've known for a long time. His his wife. He's an African American Christian. His wife is an Afghani Muslim, and wanting to recreate the, for, the freedom from fear image showing like the multiple complexities of raising African-American, Afghani, Muslim, Christian children in the United States. Um, but in can you go to yeah. one of the next ones? Um, but then, but so what started to happen is, as, as Eric mentioned, more and more people came through. Uh, this person who I did ask to come is uh, named Tadashi Nakamura. Uh, his father was interned in uh, Manzanar, a, a, a Japanese impri imprisonment camp during World War II. And so at the same time, the United States was um, kind of preaching freedom from fear. And this is him and, and his wife, uh, Karen Ishizuka. Um, and, um, and the fact that, and trying to understand, like, what are all the stories that are missing when we um, kind of buy into this kind of generic kind of great American history? But so what happened is we wound up having we had over a hundred people come through, and we we're like, uh, how could we make these images without editing anyone out? And so we realized we needed to show more and more diversity. Yeah. So there are sixteen finished images that are presented, but there is act there's actually eighty five images from that whole series, and and each one has you know stories behind each of these people in it, and part of that was who showed up, who was there. Um, one of the women that was knocking on doors was Gina Belafonte, who was also bringing around activists, you know, who um, who she knew in in L.A. and uh, other places. And this, this, I just had to point out because it was so weird. This woman right here, um, she might look familiar because she was the. Uh, we are in Orlando. She was the voice and face of Pocahontas. And it was like, how did Pocahontas show up in our shoot? <laughs> Which was, but it was like a weird thing of like 10 Native American artists and activists showed up and that was like a, a really profound thing because when we started we're like, you don't want to be tokenizing by saying, oh, you look like this, you look like this, but the diversity and a range of kind of like this family was the, her, the, the father there on the left immigrated from Kenya in the same program that Obama's father came the year before and he met his wife in Oregon and then they had all these children sitting at the table with Eric. Well, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and it's interesting because, like, the, <laughs> the husband of one of them couldn't make it, so Eric said Hank's, <laughs> Hank's ear features prominently in one of these images as well. But, um, but you know, and you have, you, it, like, these are actually composites. But, you know, that brings up the fact that these are composite images. Like, we, we didn't shoot all of these situations exactly as they are. We had a number of different images that we could fit into different places, and putting them together was like a puzzle, but also that idea of compositing, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about that since, since we did it. Um, and there's an there's a amazing Frederick Douglass speech that I've been reading that he spoke about um, a, an image of, of the United States during Reconstruction as a way to bring the Union back, the, like bring the country back together that kind of got lost in the shuffle, but what he was, what he was outlining was what he called a composite nation. Um, and, and that could become an argument for a kind of nationalism that I think a lot of people now could sign on for, as opposed to the kind of nationalism and the kind of definition that, that we think about. And I think that's something that, that, made, that we, I, I don't know that we made that direct connection, but that idea of bringing different people together into a certain kind of image was something that was very much a part of it. And, and back to your question of, of um, celebrity, we pitched this idea to Time Magazine two weeks before the election, and they said, oh, two we months. 
two months before the election. And we, we, they said, we love these images. You know, we would love to do something, but I don't know if we could do a cover. And so they wrote a really nice story featuring the images, and then it went online on the Time Magazine website. And then we started thinking about how to release the images, because our whole idea about how to release these images depended on, you know, Time Magazine cover, and then a bunch of other stuff. And um, so what happened was that uh, Alicia Keys, who Hank has met and hung out with before, but not related. She just came to us. But came by, came to us in 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 various ways. Uh, through uh, through Rosario Dawson, who was in in one of the images, she came by and looked at the images and thought about it. And she called a bunch of her celebrity friends together. I went and sat in this room with all of them. That was kind of nuts. I mean, it was weird to <laughs> be like chatting with various Gyllenhaals or or whatever. And like, <laughs> and so so then like we thought, okay, that could be a way of putting these images out. Each of them has millions of followers on social media, whatever, that could reach more people than Time Magazine. So they put it out, coordinated by Alicia, and then Time Magazine called us a couple weeks after the election and said, hey, you know what would make a great cover? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, yeah, that's <laughs> how it really was really a fascinating for, like, is who, the reason I was talking about the way it came together of us being like, we literally, the day of the shoot, have a crew and no cast yeah. and nowhere to shoot to then eight months later being, or 11 months later being on the cover of Time Magazine, which was barely like, we're like, yeah, it'd be great to be on the cover of Time Magazine. And then and, and for that to be driven by Alicia Keys calling us up and being like, you don't need Time Magazine. We got our own subscription because we have millions of followers. So like, she had like- Taraji Henson and, and Tom Hanks and yeah. all these people posting our, our images and that realizing that a lot of the media is driven by popular culture and advertising and then the way we wound up being in the New York Times, the cover of the art section and, and it's just fascinating to see how it's come together where you have like a Rothschild sitting next to uh, Angela Davis's former uh, bodyguard <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, and then um, this amazing musician Saul Williams and um, his wife and her daughter who immigrated and um, it's, it, but it's just so, so it was really just amazing to see this composite collaboration come together which really was based off the generosity of people who came to like share our time and it reminds me of uh, something that I, um, Norman Lear a famous television producer always says if, when you meet him he's like 95 now and I met him on his 91st birthday um, and it was like one o'clock in the morning he was drinking a martini and he shook my hand and he said, um, it's great to meet you. And, and, it's, and he's like, you know why? And he's looking me in the eyes and he says, because every moment, every second, every choice I've made has led me to this moment. And I'm so grateful to be here with you right now. Amazing. Um, and that idea of someone who's that been working so much as an artist, as a curator, as, a, as an activist, et cetera, every, wanting this synergy is kind of open this idea for us to be like let's all share these moments together which is what the 50 state initiative kind of comes up being and i i'm gonna hop in for 30 seconds because we I, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> <laughs> um but i think that kind of visioning the one of your strengths as a collaborative is having the big dream and putting it out there. And I'm a big believer that, you know, if you say it, you're a lot closer to it. So when you think about the 50 State Initiative, which was this massive um, action that has, as Anna said, engaged hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, partner organizations, and institutions, this was all a kind of vision of embracing democracy as your medium. Um, Hank, you've shared in the past that Four Freedoms is an opportunity to join the founding fathers in the making of America. And um, this practice for both of you was one of the kind of very profound engagements with democracy as your medium and as using the media and political action as your medium. So these images illustrate moments from the first campaign headquarters at Gansevoort Street in New York for the 50 State Initiative. Maybe the two of you could take a moment to articulate a little bit about what the vision was with this and, and how it got realized. 
Well, it's actually this, like the second or third headquarters because we, we, when we first did our first thing in 2016, it was at Jack Shaman Gallery and that became a headquarters. And when we say headquarters, you know, we didn't, so when we started it as a super PAC, we didn't know what a super PAC was. And, you know, I don't know if you all know what a super PAC is exactly, but now we do because we've talked to a lot of lawyers about what it means. And, but, no, we're, not and we're not a super PAC anymore. We, we, we left that behind um, for various reasons that are kind of interesting to go into. But, but we, we did want to work with galleries and museums and art spaces as a way to activate them uh, in various ways, um, and so, you know, turning a gallery or an art space that's supposed to be a place of contemplation and things on walls and, con you know, sort of um, very staid, we wanted to turn it into a space of working. And, you know, in my work, I've always kind of made the working process part of the actual art you know, so the, that, that, you know, eventually goes up on the wall. So this is a map here in our Gansevoort um, headquarters that where we were really literally mapping out this, this 2018 50 state initiative, which was going to be, uh, which eventually was the largest co creative collaboration uh, in American history. And we were charting it by um, contacting all these different organizations, museums, galleries, universities, artists, and starting to visualize what it would look like to, to do all these different activations all across the country. Um, and so we wound up collaborating with uh, over 250 institutions in, in all 50 states, plus DC and Puerto Rico. We worked with 800 artists to, to do exhibitions, town halls, and billboards, about 700 programs and over 200 billboards in all across the country from um, September to November of 2018. And this was, and again, this kind of generosity of a collaboration where all of these people with different political values, different kind of personal values coming together with this notion of like understanding that freedom means something different to each of us, but we can all make space under the banner of Four Freedoms to invite people to conversation, to make public statements, um, and to collaborate. And so it, for us, this, 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 um, learning experience of what it means to create a platform that just is, is really an invitation. So as you can see, this is the, a, a, a billboard by Carrie Mae Weems with the Ringling Museum. Um, and not knowing what different artists are going to do. Um, we, this is uh, Paula, Paula, Crown. Uh, Paula Crown, whose billboard says Thoughts and Prayers that was in, in Wyoming, but she also did it in Chicago. And this this kind of act of faith that the artists give, because you see their names aren't on the billboards, but also, so they're making work with us, for us, as us, um, but also just us. <laughs> um, but also um, all of these people who drove across the country to document these billboards for us. It was like, it's such a, the generosity of human beings is in the spirit of, of uh, America. <laughs> is is really uh, the creative spirit is really kind of alive in this project, and we were really um, so excited to be part of. To this is I think now uh, our, our collectively like our fifth project here, um, right. with with, with uh, Rollins, and and just to see kind of how these projects grow. And there were and and you know part of the premise of the project is that there are these cultural there's there's a, an underlying cultural infrastructure around the country that already exists and that we're just trying to kind of wrap our arms around and, you know, kind of lift up in various ways um, and, and, and help create a map, really, of, of the entire network. Can you go back, can you go back to, can you talk about Yeah, to the, yeah, so this, this billboard um, is a good example. You know, we did some billboards in 2016 that got quite a bit of attention, but this is one from the 2018 um, campaign in all 50 states and Puerto Rico and DC. This is by an artist named uh, Jamila El Sahili in, in Lansing, Michigan. And the word means human being in Arabic. But when it was written in this way on a billboard in public space, even though it's you know, in Michigan where there's a large Arab population, um, that the, uh, the billboard company got a lot of calls saying, what's this mean? Is this ISIS? Like, uh, what is this crazy, you know, other language? And so, um, 
so that you know that kind of reaction then people reported on it and 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 it became a larger kind of dialogue about what it what this billboard means and what Jamila's art practice was kind of evoking as questions. Later, we heard from um, Representative Ilhan Omar's uh, chief of staff, who you know said, did, "Was that you guys that did that billboard? Oh my goodness, that like we didn't realize, but just having that up kind of um, gave us a sense that somebody had our backs, you know, like as she was running a campaign." Uh, you know, where there was, there were like a lot of antagonism towards her as a candidate. And so, um, you know, this wasn't something that we intended, but it had all these billboards and stuff had all these ripple effects. It's so, so much of what you're talking about is again, this unfolding in your practice and the way you brought organizations into the fold and how they become the family um, of partnership. What were the other kind of dialogues and relationships that were unsuspected? that revealed themselves over time. Well, this is an artist, um, Christine Sung Kim, who is a deaf artist, who um, really is kind of often challenging ableism and getting us to question kind of our notions of the truth and reality. Um, and so just the simple conversation of like, her, she had another billboard that said, deaf culture is a thing, Google that shit. <laughs> and we're like, okay. <laughs> um, but the, really this idea of, and so then the billboard company's like, well, this is not an ad for Google, so you have to take, change Google or blah, blah, blah. You can't use the other word. Yeah, you can't use the other <laughs> word too. But she had an X or something the other day. But, um, but this I think of that each of these artists, because there's a presumption that all these artists come from the same perspective, different values, and in a way, we having to learn from different, the different values of different artists and the different practices that, because what we believe is that artists are civic leaders, they have stories to tell that are, that should be driving our culture. We have a lot of uh, non-creative people shaping the narratives that our laws are designed around. And what we want to do is make space for artists to tell the stories that, you know, that open, so Josoy Valida, um, uh, Stacy Kirby collaborating with uh, an organization in, in, in Durham about kind of the rights of, of Latin American immigrants and them being the ambassadors of their work, but us also having to kind of become a part of something that we often don't know much about. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's really been the most amazing thing is just learning more about the different artists' practices, how deep they go, and trying to find ways to elevate and promote the work that they do. Absolutely. The other thing that's interesting from a narrative perspective is to get this done, you collaborated with Kickstarter to fund these, this 50, 50 state initiative, which was not just the billboards. The billboards were some of the most prominent elements, but there were exhibitions, other activations, town halls. Um, and in order to get Kickstarter going, you had to create also a really broad public narrative about your role as artists and your fellow collaborators as agents of change, as people, Hank, as you said, who could change the narrative. Can you talk a little bit about that development and that collaboration? Yeah, that, um, so Kickstarter usually only lets you run one campaign per project, you know, to, fund, to get it crowdfunded. But because of the nature of this project, they sort of bent the rules a little bit and they allowed us to run 52 simultaneous campaigns for $3,000 each to raise money for one billboard in each state and Puerto Rico and DC. And so um, it, it, it really was like a political campaign. I mean, we were calling people, we were, you know, doing these phone-a-thons and like other things to just get people involved. At, at the $10 level, it was not, you know, it was not a, a, a heavy lift asking for, you know, $10. It was something we felt comfortable that we could just ask, but we wanted as many people to participate as possible. So we ended up getting like 2,000 people, over 2,000 people involved. And that was a really important way to show the kind of um, possibility of mobilizing different people. But it also became a kind of practice in and of itself to get others in, engaged in, in the whole process. And, and these, other, these other activations I should mention, the, the, the town halls and the, um, the, um, the, lawn, sign. the lawn sign activations, you know, they were, they were sort of trying to take 
political conventions that we know about, you know, like lawn signs or, you know, dialogue the way candidates do. Even the name, the 50 state initiative, it's like a political strategist like dream, right? That they could campaign and talk to everybody in all 50 states, but the realities of campaign finance are such that they can't, there's no reason for the Democratic Party to go to Alabama or, or you know, whatever. And what's exciting was seeing how, as you can see, um, the, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, a lot of the projects were directed by the institutions because we wanted to be local and national and recognizing that we don't know what's going on all these places, but there is this amazing infrastructure of institutions that connect with the public everywhere, all across the country that rarely get a chance to kind of connect and, and be part of something that's about political speech and engagement. And so that was really exciting just to find all the different creative ways that people found connections and then collaborated with like the Alphon N in this case to, to, to bring the public into the discourse. It was incredibly exciting. These are images that we're going through now of the various activations here at Rollins. Um, you can see Dr. Heller here in the galleries with students in the town hall. Um, but one of the other super exciting things was when you went to the headquarters and you went down into the basement and you saw all of those color-coded index cards with institutions all over the country. Um, and very specific, as you saw with Gisela and um, Anna's names at the top, very specific individuals who are spearheading this and the way that you built this infrastructure to support it. And how personal it was on the ground level in each location. So when you think about your learnings, what you took from this in 2018, and you're looking forward to the future. Here with, uh, are some of our students. <laughs> um, what are some of the things that have informed the way you're going to approach the next go around? We're afraid of what we think is possible because <laughs> we had all of these ideas that we somehow managed to do. Um, and we're not quite sure how, besides just like coming up with ridiculous ideas like, let's do billboards all across the country with institutions and collaboration and town halls and blah, blah, blah. And like, be on the cover of Time Magazine. Yeah, be on the cover of Time Magazine. Um, so that actually is, is daunting to us, but we realize also, if you think about the, especially the last three presidents, um, no one would have really ever thought that they could have ever been president but they believed in themselves and they got other people to believe in them. And that is something that I think artists also um, are driven by. This, you have to be driven by this deep optimism and belief that you have value and that wherever you begin will lead you some, somewhere. And so we're collecting, Eric has more courage than I do at the moment because I'm just like, I don't even, I felt like we got it by, by the skin of our teeth by not kind of causing any major controversy or any explosion of like, you know, people calling names and doing this and that. Um, so, but um, this, this need, you know, this in, in Newark, it was just for, so touching to do, to do something like this. And we realized that this should be a normal thing that, um, the, you know, more people go to like museums and, and colleges and universities than go to sports games. Um, every year and so how do we kind of activate the normalcy of, of political creative engagement we, we believe in creative patriotism and so we want to do another 50 state initiative yeah. but we also want to see continue to see our, all our partners to build off of what happened here and teach us more and that faith I think was based on reactions like Enna's beautiful letter that she wrote us about what it meant to her, which you know, I uh, I won't share it unless anyone wants to share about it. But um, but you know, the 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 idea that this was touching people in a very personal way across the country that were being involved for uh, for their own reasons, for their own relationships to notions of of why they were engaging with art and with you know political engagement and and um, and with education. I mean, this, these, these were, these gave us, these kind of fueled the idea. And, and also, people were innovating with this platform. We sent out toolkits to people with a vague idea that you could, you know, participate in all these different ways. And they came back with, you know, amazing, wild, sometimes not so great, but mostly <laughs> pretty amazing things that people did across the country. When you look back now from where you sit at the nature of your own collaboration, 
Is it what you anticipated from when you started your dialogue all those years ago? I think it's that and so much more because we've had to become better people through the collaborations and like listen to one another. A lot of times when Eric and I have a deep disagreement, there's a feeling, of, okay, we're gonna get somewhere even though like I don't wanna like do anything right now, but this really, this need to listen um, and the growth through like, I feel strongly about this and you feel strongly about this. And like, then someone else will come who was not part of the conversation then like, make us both feel foolish. And we're like, okay, we gotta listen to that. And we really wanna not stop growing. You know, what Four Freedoms is about is being open to listening to other people's perspectives and, and being affected and changed by it. And if anything, we really, I think our job won't be done in a way until people feel more comfortable moving away from the, the generic left, right, Republican, Democrat binaries that kind of force us to choose a team and then like root for that team no matter <laughs> who the players are. <laughs> um, and think about you know how do we make a society that allows for diversity of opinion, diversity of values, but also um, respect and this necessity to understand that there's a need to conserve, but progress is inevitable. And this kind of tension is what makes us great. Um, and not to be afraid of that, but, and, but to really trust that, which yeah. is kind of what we've learned so much. Yeah, I mean, I think early on, one of the very first things our very first conversations was like, okay, what is this gonna look like that's successful? And I think, I can't remember which one of us said it to each other, but it was like that we're still friends at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that's hard. Collaboration is really, really hard. I've, found, I've collaborated throughout my career with various artists, various people who are not artists, and you know, I'm mostly friends with them. Uh, <laughs> But it's always really hard and it brings its own challenges. And that's part of, I mean, that's kind of what we're addressing really with the project is that like working together is hard. And maybe because we still like each other, like for now, for now <laughs> so far, that, that we're like modeling out trust and figuring out ways to be self-critical and critical of each other, but like also, you know, we don't necessarily always have to be right all the time, although mostly I'm right. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think- But also, yeah. just, but, that's, but that's what, that's the model, and so what Four Freedoms being like, okay, now we're collaborating, but then we're collaborating, and we're collaborating, and we're collaborating, yeah. and this, this, this kind of circle that gets bigger and bigger, and it still relies on this faith, and the biggest thing that can actually ruin any collaboration is mistrust. And sometimes you're not gonna understand where another person's going until you're way past your point of patience. Yeah. But standing in that space of frustration can actually lead you to open your eyes to things that you would have never had the courage or wisdom or experience to do. But it's also, I mean, it, yes, trust, but also- um, You had a disagreement with me, right? Ego. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think ego is another related thing, but I think it's like, it's, it's bound up in the idea that we own our ideas and we have to like, you know, put, put our value forward. And there's a certain dignity to that, right? Like, as opposed to relinquishing or listening or like changing your ideas, this is my shout out to my mom, um, <laughs> where like listening becomes the thing, you know? Like, I, and, and, and that I think is a, a different position, and it's certainly a different position in our political discourse to imagine that activity or action is like listening and saying I'm wrong or I'm sorry or something like that. Can you talk about this relationship to these? Absolutely. Yeah. You want to hop in or you want to? No, I was saying Eric. He was directing me. The, the, uh, <laughs> these these are, are sort of the, the latest innovation on the, on the lawn signs, which um, we have an amazing designer that works with us at times, um, that, uh, whose name is Albert Ignacio, who, who designed the lawn signs which went viral. There were thousands of, tens of thousands of lawn signs printed across the country. Um, but they were printed and then probably thrown away and nobody kept them all. They were all kind of, we gave away the design and people used them locally here or, or wherever. 
Um, so we started thinking, well, what would it look like to build something that continued to accumulate? And so this became a digital freedom quilt, which we've now done at MoMA, at Sundance. Uh, we're doing it here. We've done it at several. We're doing it, going to do it at the Whitney, um, where people can add their pictures, their freedom of blank, or freedom from blank, or freedom to, or freedom for. And then uh, that will accumulate into a large digital quilt that, again, we don't know what we're going to do with. And, and each of them has someone saying there, if you go back to the, the, uh, the page before, you see that all, all of these people have their own responses to, um, and some of them are kind of, you know, surprising. Um, and, but, and, and this idea that freedom means something different to me than it means to you, but we can still be part of this quilt of society. Um, so the legacy of four freedoms, you, you've had the big vision to be able to say, I can imagine something glorious, both of you. Do you go as far to think about what the legacy will be lasting down the road? <laughs> I think, I, yeah, you go. our le legacy, I think, we hope is that someone who's more talented, more creative, more industrious than us, um, we'll make the two or three, we like to think of ourselves as the friendster of uh, art and political uh, engagement. And hopefully, I mean, I don't know now, I don't want to say Facebook, the Instagram, <laughs> but hopefully someone will make the 2.0 and 3.0 and 4.0 versions of what we're doing and make it much more exciting, more complicated, uh, and more normal for people who don't see themselves as artists to be involved in creative work like this, but also for creative people to recognize that their work doesn't necessarily have to look political to be political, but for us to really recognize the really intricate value of art in our, in our society, because without art, you can't have a culture, and without culture, you can't have a civic, civil society. And so if people really stop dismissing art and thinking that this is the thing that you put to the side or add last, but rather than recognizing that it's the one thing that keeps us together, that would be the most amazing element of our legacy, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, and it also depends on what we do next a little bit, because if we do the crazy things that we're talking about, then... Which they won't share tonight, we already <laughs> tried. <laughs> well, I mean, we can, yeah. Uh, we just don't know for sure what we're gonna do next. So if we, if we, if we do the crazy things that we're talking about, then the legacy expands in terms of its potential. And we'd love for people to forget our names. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna open it up to questions, but I think just as a parting thought, you know, participation, you've opened the door for all of us tonight to participate in this quilt. You've opened up the door for communities across the country and um, the territories to participate. And so as advocates for these gentlemen, you know, raise your hand as they come into this next stage, looking into the next um, election season and beyond. We have an opportunity to be um, engaged with them. So are there any questions? In the back? Really? She doesn't speak, she's from Lebanon, she doesn't speak Farsi. Thank you. No, no. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we, we trusted the artist in that case, so yeah. It's good to know. Yes. yes. For me, um, it makes my individual practice seem boring at times um, because I get to learn and become such a better 
artist, really by facilitating space for other artists. And it's just like, how do you get this connection of like the juice of like, wow, you're approaching this from a different perspective as me. And then, so when I get into the studio and I'm trying to do things on my own, I'm like, uh, uh, is it gonna be like in all 50 states simultaneously and so <laughs> complex and this and that? No? <laughs> like, um, so, and, and, and I meet new artists or see artists like uh, Wanda Ortiz who we haven't collect, collaborated with yet and I'm like, oh, yes. yet? <laughs> and, and, and think that, you know, the individual is the collective and that we, it doesn't have to have um, my name on it to be a part of, for me to be a part of it. Yeah, and I, I, um, <laughs> it's hard to answer that question in part because Four Freedoms has taken up so much time that my individual practice is kind of like now fitting into a smaller thing. Although I do consider this part of my individual practice too. So I, but, um, but I think that the work that I, do and I'm working on in my own practice is is connected. I just haven't. I, I I think the difference with this project for me is, and I was saying this earlier, is that my my work is largely about creating these kind of models of how things might happen and the scale at which we're working on this project. It, it's really a question of scale, and and the the scale on in this project is allows the fact that I'm not just creating a model, but I'm actually doing the thing in which case it stops being art, in which case it's maybe art that stops being art, which is weird and interesting and, you know. Good, yeah. So, um, thank, thank you guys um, for, for making this work and for coming to Orlando. I think people forget about us and we really appreciate it. Um, and Well, Hank had a baby just days ago, and he's here today, so thank you. Um, and I had two kids the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we should be getting his mind and pass. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I think that's, uh, and Michelle and, and Wyatt, many of our collaborators had children during this project, actually during this specific <laughs> project, and never stopped really working on it and that's kind of um, but you should really talk about that because you've well, traveled I mean, all over the well we both have a lot of things happening I mean it's um, and you have a job and I teach and um, you know and uh, like fortunately um, Jamila and I my wife and I are, are pretty good a at different like Jamila. handing off a different Jamila um, and uh, you know like she also is doing a lot of ambitious things. So it's just, I, there's no easy answer. It's like, I'm exhausted. It's like, <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> and I can't stop and it's great. And it's amazing. And you know, like we're just, we're doing it. I mean, Abby, you should talk about it too. I mean, you have three kids and, and run the world. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, Wait. you're literally, like I was in New York, this, you're driving back and forth and flying. No. I think for, for all of us and for my colleague Molly and Giselle, and it's a calling, right? You do this because you probably don't have another choice. You're compelled to make the work, you're compelled to make a difference and do the best that you can, I would guess, right? Yeah, but I mean, I, but I will say, I think it's because Eric is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> because now that I'm only 11 days in and I'm, I'm recognizing <laughs> that he, he's had almost- It's it. finally even. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the, yeah, the, the, the way that you've been able to work and be present and collaborate and also uh, raise these two beautiful girls as well as your wife traveling as well and working intensely and yeah. manage it all. Like you've collaborated and you kind of somehow have managed to incorporate a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, and you're gonna bring Zenzi all over the place and all over the world and like, you know, and you know, I don't think this stuff, yeah, it's gonna keep happening because that's how we're working, but like, 
you know, and my mom is amazing, and you know, we have amazing friends and family, at, you know, to help and figure stuff out. But it's it's not easy. At, although, like, both my daughters love wearing their Four Freedoms onesies and T-shirts, and you know, <laughs> like. And they love coming to shows and running around and, you know, you know, Wanda. I mean, like, and I also grew up, my mother as being a curator who was here and, and photo historian, collaborated with Snap as well. Um, and yeah, you, as a kid, you just get used to being in places with strangers who are doing exciting and interesting things and um, sticking close to your parents and hopefully learning through osmosis. So. Not to jump back into the dialogue, but there was one thing I'd wanted to say, which is that in our converse, in your conversation for for Rollins, Eric, you said that Hank, you know, kind of had this nascent experience growing up that gave him great confidence to change institutions because he saw how it could happen from the inside out and how that had an impact on you. So as you think about your kids now, all of them, and the community of kids around you, do you feel like you two are also setting? and your community is setting a new standard for how to change an organization and an institution? Mm. They're too tired. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can let everyone go to dinner. Yeah, no, I mean, yes. And I want to make sure that, um, so Sika, my older one, uh, like makes so much art that like I have to quietly throw it out at night or battle with myself to not throw it out. But I'm like, I, yes, I mean like, I, I'm hoping, I, I don't know what I'm doing as a parent yet either, so maybe the, the idea that Four Freedoms didn't know what we were doing and we've gotten this far with it gives me some confidence, but I feel like, but I, hopefully that stuff will make its way into the parenting. It's just that there are, there, there are also a lot of pressures to, um, to do things, you know, a, a different way or a normal way or like, and so the challenge that I, that I impose in my work and in our, in, in our project together, like the, the challenging of institutions and stuff feels different when I'm like applying it to a three-year-old, you know? And so, but it feels dangerous, but then it, then I question myself like, shouldn't it feel dangerous to do that also? But I don't know, so I haven't figured it out, obviously. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh, okay, last one. Sorry. Well, we do believe that although many people do engage with art in museums and galleries and on college campuses, that a lot of people don't feel welcome in the spaces. And so we want to make the space more public because what art fundamentally is about is critical thinking and that we don't think that there's enough critical discourse and critical thinking in public speech and political speech, most of the things we see in the public are telling us where to go, what to buy, and who to be. And we saw that what great art often does is it asks questions of the viewer, of the artist, of society, and that if we are more comfortable with complicated questions that don't have easy answers in society, maybe uh, we'll be more comfortable with um, the complexity of what it means to have 300 million or 7 billion people trying to make um, a life that means something. Um, and really, it, again, it was, it's been an act of faith because we didn't censor or curate much of, like we chose the artist, sometimes the artist chose us, but really whatever they gave us, pretty much we put up. And so even the accessibility of it is really much, very much the intention of the artists as much as it is us. Well, and, and the other thing that makes me think of when you ask that question is that, you know, we specifically are putting art in places where art is not necessarily supposed to be. And we're also turning 
spaces of art into things that spaces of art are not supposed to be. There have been town halls, you know, where um, things have happened that I've never experienced in, in an art space. And so shifting what the institution means, shifting where art or creative thinking is allowed um, is again a kind of model for how we might shift these other systems of power, which art ultimately is, right? Well, we can't thank you enough for your generosity, not just tonight. Thank you. Thank you for being such a great leader and inviting us into so many exciting and wonderful spaces and supporting us. Um, from the beginning, yeah. It's a long conversation and we're all honored to be a part of it. We hope everyone tonight will participate in the Four Freedoms Quilt Outside. There are students who are helping, so you can also engage with them. Um, and we're just thrilled to have had the opportunity to share this evening. Thank you so much.